This is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, January 4th, 2024, the first call of the new year. And uh, here we are. Um, we were just kicking back and forth a tiny bit that it's going to be a, an exciting year. Mike is uh, relentlessly and hopelessly optimistic, as is his course through life, I think. It's an easier path. Although at some point I'll be diagnosed for being pathologically optimistic and I don't know what they'll treat me with. There should be like a DCM entry for that. Uh, so uh, what is, is it the DCM? What's the diagnostic manual? It's a DCM, yeah. Yeah, it's the DCM. Hey Doug, Ooh. happy new year. Uh, today it, we alternate uh, formats usually, and today is a check-in call. Uh, we have a check-in format that not all of you have been through, so I'll um, explain it briefly. Uh, we've evolved one where we sort of pause between check-ins, so we have people step in when they feel like it, uh, when they feel moved to uh, step in and check in. We try to check in only once during check-ins, and I do not play uh, sort of traffic police during the check-in. I just sort of step out and wait for people to step in, unless there's somebody new into the group that doesn't know the protocol, or something else runs um, awry, in which case I will I will step in. But I'll wait until everybody's uh, gone, and then we'll step. We'll pick something that came up during the check-in, uh, and use that for the rest of our time today. But uh, the notion is just to make this a free space. And a couple of our calls at the end of uh, Yay, Stacey. Um, a couple of our calls uh, were in the fall of last oh. year felt a little bit like Quaker meeting. Uh, there were long silences and I was getting, even I, who am pretty patient with silence, was getting a little bit nervous and everybody was like, this feels like a meeting space. It's great. So so I, ro I rolled with that and it's been great. Uh, with that, I will, what did I forget from the, the protocol? Um, I think that's it. Uh, with that, I'll step back and see who'd like to lead us into check-ins. Um, I... Quick question. Please. Um, these are pretty intimate conversations, but we do record them and we make them available. Do you have any sense of how many people watch the replays? Um, so I occasionally look at the traffic we get and most of our calls will get 20 or 30 views within a couple months, which is tiny, but but not zero. Um, a friend of my, so my support is Aikido. One of my buddies in the dojo often will watch our calls uh, and will make a comment to me in the dojo on Thursday nights. So, you know, Thursday morning is our call, our group call. I, I upload uh, and then he will have watched a piece of it or something uh, by, by Thursday at six, which is interesting. So um, so some people are are enjoying these and. And I get the occasional comment. I got a I got a, a new LinkedIn friend request recently from somebody I didn't know. And he said, I just want to thank you for posting these calls. Um, I find that they're, you know, convivial, intelligent conversation among people who care for each other, et cetera. They, they have been like a uh, I'm I'm paraphrasing poorly, but they've been sort of an oasis for me. And I was like, that's exactly what I'm hoping. I I I couldn't ask for anything better than that. Maybe we're spreading optimism. Well, thank you. I, I suspect most of them are people who are part of our community and just can't make it. But uh, I was just curious whether we had followers in China or something. <laughs> I, th I think it spreads beyond the people who are uh, explicitly in OGM. I think I think there's a there's a reach for people who I don't know who like the conversations. So thanks. That, that warms my heart. Thanks for asking. Yep. Uh, with that, I'm going to mute myself and step in at some point during the check-in, but I'll let everybody uh, take turns coming in and feel free to pause for a while. Uh, use your electronic hand to get kind, uh, kind of in the queue to check in. And um, whoever's next to check in, if you unmute while your hand is up, that will tell us that you know that you're ready to jump in, but you can take as long as you wish to give us some pause and some breathing space before jumping in. So. We are off.
Uh, I will jump in. We started by talking about optimism, but I'm going to be a little down, um, mostly because of my professional work on digital policy. And in the last two weeks, there's just been an eruption of really troubling developments that will fundamentally shape the way we use digital technology, uh, if they go the wrong way. And so we have the New York Times suing OpenAI, trying to basically make you read, make you pay anytime you want to read something. That's basically where that leads you. It almost is a footnote tax. I mean, if you want to copy somebody's text and put it in an article you write and add a an annotation, you will. I mean, that, that, that well, leads you to that kind of end result. Everything's locked down. You pay for everything. More, more seriously, we have in the UK and now a number of states, the idea that companies have to design in surveillance. There's a lawsuit where several parents who lost children to fentanyl, who were able to get the drug through encrypted message services that automatically erase, uh, these companies have been sued because they didn't make it easy to track down illegal activities. So again, fundamental change in how we view the internet. I mean, and again, the, the next step in that logic is that every phone call should be recorded so that if there's any uh, illegal activity on a phone call, the police should be able to find out. Another one that only the nerds care about is that the White House, for political reasons, decided they're no longer going to fight for global flows of data. This has been something bipartisan. We've all fought for it for 30 years. It's Everybody thought it was a good idea, but apparently Elizabeth Warren decided that this is uh, something that benefits Google, so she's against it. And so she called up the US Trade Representative and we're now backing away from some one of the core foundational ideas of the internet. And it doesn't just affect social media, it affects general electric engines and manufacturing and security. So I'm I'm just watching all this go on and wondering who's thinking seriously about it and feeling a little inadequate because I, I don't write all that well. I should be writing a 500 page, 500 word screed every three days, given what's out there. And I'm tweeting, but that's not sufficient. And then on a health thing, I'm I'm discovering that I, I I can't trust medical devices. I, I I saved money and bought Warby Parker glasses about a year ago. Went back to the optometrist and discovered that the prescription was not only wrong, there was, it was actually warped. It was the, the lens was not correct. And I'd been having problems with eye strain. No idea why. So it's just, there's all these all these things that I'm frustrated about. <laughs> so, but I do have this belief that things will get better in the long run and that technology can help us out. So that's where I'm at. And I did have a wonderful break for, for Christmas. And I did watch some incredible movies. If people have not seen Boys in the Boat, which came out on Christmas Day, even if you don't, care about rowing and you don't care about sports it is a great movie the book is even better but it takes longer and the boy and the heron is the latest from the ghibli studio in japan if you like animation it will expand your horizons on what animation can do
Okay, well, I'm going to jump in here. Um, I was really struck last week by the fact that Jerry called for uh, us talking about the year past and the year to come, and nobody did that. Not only that, nobody talked about uh, climate change and related issues. And I'm just wondering whether the lack of uh, participation here is a deeper phenomena that's related to the fact that we're not talking about the things that people really need to talk about. Uh, I don't know what to do about it or what that means. Uh, I do not have a positive interpretation of it. Well, I sort of do. And that is that we like to have a place where we can hang out and not have to deal with serious issues. Uh, but that's a great reach. I'm mostly thinking like, we just are avoiding the obvious. I mean, we're on a crash course with history. Uh, coming out of COP, it was clear that there's no leadership in the world to pick up the baton after COP and go anywhere with it. And the COP itself was very thin in terms of any outcome. People were still talking about, oh, we've got to keep, keep from reaching 1.5 degrees when the scientists have tell, told us we've already reached it. Uh, so I'm deeply puzzled and uh, personally concerned that we're not talking about the things that uh, I particularly care about. Uh, and I'm seeing it as a group phenomena that I don't yet understand. End of thought. Jerry, can you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I see myself signing in on the bottom there, but I'm not, I didn't do anything. Can you kick that other Stacy off without um, I, kicking I, me off? I think that the other Stacy will fall off. Uh, okay. Let me see if I can do it. I can remove, yes. Thank you. I don't know how that, <laughs> it just popped up. You are there now only once. Thank you. Are you okay, Doc? You still have your hand up. Oh, thank you. So for now 2024, um, I'm still following the logic of the Neil book um, because it really it really gets you to to follow, you know, a process um of thinking deeper into into um uh, an issue without um having you know, sort of preconceived ideas it's what theory you call stepping into the future as it unfolds right you don't really quite know what unfolds and how but when you see it you step into it so the the I've been working, you know, with a with a range of NGOs, you know, Climate Reality Project and Sierra Club and the American Sustainable Business Network, and you now it's, it's sort of a consortium of uh, of uh, agriculture and food focused uh, NGOs. And a lot of time for the last almost two years now has been spent for us to really dig into the farm bill and understand the legislative process and the technicalities of the farm bill. And we have just made huge strides to, to really uh, get into the system. But what uh, my partner from Climate System Solutions and I are now uh, working on is to, um, is to engage with business people, you know, and, uh, um, and to to draw in you know farmers and processors you know, and uh, uh, technical service providers and so on into a discussion um, that allows a um, a synchronization effort because 
what you see in the industry, and that's just, uh, and I actually wrote in one of my newsletters about synchronicity, um, is that the, the industry government you know, is working in silos. So you have these silo approaches to, to finding solutions that are often contradictory, they fight each other uh, inadvertently you know, because uh, some great sounding idea um, is creating externalities that are just not um, being, that they're just not surfacing because the process you know, of developing ideas and, and solutions isn't, uh, isn't uh, uh, creative it's just it's not um it's not uh bringing up you know these these uh, relationships and, and and uh and connections and interdependencies so we have a workshop uh, that we're kicking off and you know, the founder from the kiss the ground organization is in there the board chair of the organic consumer association we have a couple of farmers um we have uh, uh, a couple of international companies who are um, uh, providing uh, equipment. I mean, technical solutions that are that are quite creative and interesting. And we want to see if we can find develop you know, synergies that um, that uh, lead to uh, more ideas and and uh, and spark you know new ways of, of thinking. And so I don't really have uh, any intentions. I just turned 74 in December. <laughs> I have no intentions of exiting my retirement. Um, but I do I do like um, to provide you know, thought leadership based on you know my 50 you know, some years of experience in the food business um, and uh, uh, and see where where that can take us. You know, Jerry, that new book idea was absolutely amazing. You know, because it provides um, guidance. You know, in the structure, you know, uh, in the way uh, to to uh, explore a topic and advance it. Um, and then working with AI has been another amazing thing. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just like my buddy. So we are we having conversations, and uh, it's uh, it's absolutely astounding how uh, how you can in uh, uh, in half an hour explore a topic uh, with background information that would take you days uh, to to accumulate. So so that's that's sort of my hope is to to bring topics down to the base right because they when you when you talk it at, at, at meta level uh um the the, the people there is an understanding in stories it's, it's structuring stories to where they just make sense the most the most difficult things to develop in story format is when everybody says the you know of course Right, because when when you have this aha, uh, of course, kind of effect, then you just have really achieved something. But to get to that, <laughs> it just takes a lot of time and work. Yeah. Um, and so, so I'm all in for um, common sense aha effects um, that have people um, uh, engage and understand and and uh, and uh, sign up for for um, uh, changing, adapting, because uh, you know, Doug already mentioned, we were hitting uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, this summer, last summer. We are scheduled, we are on track to hit two degrees this summer. Um, I was listening in on a conversation with Bill Gates, where he very nonchalantly uh, says, yeah, two degrees is already baked in, we're done with that. We're trying to stay below three degrees. And I'm thinking, how insane is that? I mean, every scientist out there will tell you that the uh, climate models basically are unable 
to model anything beyond 1.5 degrees. They had this threshold where they thought that up to 1.5 degrees, you can sort of predict what will happen. You can sort of uh, you know, understand the mechanisms that, that, that govern this system that we are discovering, we are, um, we are totally dependent on, but, but two degrees bets are off. And this guy's talking about three degrees, like, yeah, maybe we can stay below this, right? So there's this, this insanity uh, in, in uh, people who have incredible impact, you know, incredible resources that they put to use. And if their thinking is misguided and they invest these, these tens and hundreds of millions of dollars in places where uh, they do more harm than good, then we're really in deep trouble and bill gates is out there buying up farmland he's already the largest farmland owner in the world so so the to 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 get to consensus opinion on on where we are what we're facing and understanding that uh food really is the base of pyramid uh, economy without which we the, the society will simply collapse you know, if you don't protect the bottom uh, the 50 60 percent of the population i mean the us at first 44 million people on food stamps yeah. um, so anyway uh it's going to be it's going to be an interesting year and we'll keep on uh doing our new book and and uh, develop stories and see where it will take us. Oh, um, I'll jump in. Uh, I don't want to say much personally, um, but it, it's interesting. I just want to pick up on one thing that, that Klaus said, the idea of digging in and analyzing the farm bill. Um, so my 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 take on, on such things is that um, here we are, intelligent, rational actors. <laughs> and unfortunately, we're dealing in a world where rational action is not present anymore. I.e., I heard a report, <clears throat> There was I was listening um, to a report this morning about the situation at the border. And something like 300,000 people crossed the border last year in Texas. <clears throat> and Biden has proposed one point two no twelve point two billion dollars to deal with the with the border. <clears throat> and a Republican congressman, I think from Oklahoma, said, There's no way I'm I'm getting near voting on that or acting on that because I don't want to give Biden any kind of credit at all. Um, and that's the world we're we're operating in. So when we look at rational action and think about rational action, um, where are you going to go with that? You know, um, there are no more statesmen. There are no more people who are, or there are a few, shouldn't, I shouldn't say all, few people that are actually looking at the greater good. Um, but you've got a lot of players playing in that way. So... I'm not sure anymore what kind of windmills to tilt at at this point in time. Um, so that's all I want to say. And that's today. And yesterday was probably a little different. Maybe tomorrow will be a little different also. But that's today's thought. Mm -hmm.
You'd think somebody who programmed computers for 35 years could use one. But that would be a mistake. Um, yeah, I just want to share for me, since it's a check-in, um, I really like what Mike said about optimism. I think I've been a very optimistic person most of my life. I've been fortunate, actually, in my life. So, But um, recently I had a visit with... Uh, a doctor and, and so they go through all these questions you know and they ask you well you know have you been depressed so i said it was my sleep doctor i said well aside from reading the news i you know from what's in the daily news and she sort of like said yeah yeah i looked at her i said no i'm serious it actually does make me anxious <laughs> and i waited for her to like actually listen to it so I do feel a little, I'm not as, uh, I don't know, it's partially what Doug has been talking about too, about being in conversations about what I'm feeling is really important. Um, but anyway, so I just, uh, I have some stubborn faith in humans because we're human. On the other hand, what Stuart said about humans, you know, we're also a little, you know, crazy sometimes. So anyway, I think, so that's all I can say about this year. I'm a little anxious, but I'm, um, Happy to be here with you all participate. So, um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Doug. Um, I'm sorry I missed the first five minutes and I missed what uh, Mike was saying about uh, optimism because uh, I am a big fan of optimism. I've always tried to be optimistic. I always look for the possibilities uh, when other people don't see them. And I'm happy it was a framing comment for this conversation, uh, which is very valuable for me. I try to get here whenever I can. Uh, but I don't like to use this forum for negativity. So let me, I mean, I, I don't want to say I'm not concerned with what's happening in the world. Uh, every day in the last week, the... Dutch newspapers have been articulating the certainty of Trump in the election this year and uh, giving endless coverage of what's going on in Gaza and the Ukraine and the right-wing populists who won the election in the Netherlands and what that may bring. But uh, instead of talking about negative things, which somehow I 
try to avoid as much as possible. I looking for lenses, another new lenses to to look at what's really possible in the world, whether they be from philosophy or science fiction or fantasy. Uh, just trying to find uh, uh, new and unexpected ways to enter into the conversation. So since it's a check-in, I guess I should say I've been revisiting uh, the Harry Potter films in the last uh, holiday period and the Hobbit films, which were all broadcast on Dutch television, and looking at them through their imaginative content to the emotional content they seem to have on or seem to have had on a lot of people. And uh, I am taking uh, a number of philosophical courses, which is helping me learn how to think through the lenses of philosophy, science fiction, fantasy. I've just registered for a course called How to Read the Tea Leaves about what science fiction novels can tell us about both the times they were written in and the times of today. Registered for a second course about how society has viewed nature through the lenses of philosophy and literature since uh, the Christian age. Uh, my course in Man in Search of Man, Humanism and Religion in the past three century, in the past uh, uh, 200, uh, 2,500 years, starting with the axial age that's still continuing. And uh, not being blind to what's happening in the world outside of uh, fantasy and philosophy and science fiction, I'm constantly uh, triggered by how authors, poets, artists, philosophers have been able to change the way their societies have thought about the world and acted in the world in the last 2,500 years. And knowing that it always has been possible gives me uh, the uh, solace and optimism that it may still be possible in our times. Well, let me say differently, that it is possible in our times if we find the right notes to play. So that's my contribution this afternoon. We all should be saying what we're really thinking. And what I'm thinking is, this is a waste of time. You're wasting my time, all of you. Sitting here in a dead silence when there's so much to say and talk about. And that what gets talked about doesn't seem uh, to warrant the meditative time that went into it. Well, Doug, you're free to turn off soon. And I appreciate your urging us to higher levels, but this call is what it is right now. We love having you here. You push us quite hard, but you're free to leave. And we're in the check-in round. We're not in a conversation round. And I, for one, hope Doug does not leave. I second that, and I also second what Jerry said. Um, so I'll check in now. Um, I've been focused more on 
what's really what really drives me, which is spiritual psychology, and been spending more time thinking about conscious evolution. Um, and part of that is becoming responsible for our choices. So that's the only reason that I would echo what Jerry said to Doug, which is you can leave because that's the truth, you could. Um, and that's not to say, Doug, I do want you here, um, but I think it's really important that we are very careful with what we say and the energy we put out. Um, I can go in a million directions and I don't wanna do that. So let me just stick with saying uh, what Hank said touched a few things in me. So I'm a very optimistic person by nature, but I'm also pragmatic. That being said, so interestingly enough, um, over the past couple of days, I finally got in a little bit of the Israel conversation on Facebook. Not that I wanted to, but it was somebody that I know and respect somewhere over. I don't remember if she's in the nether. I don't remember where she is. But all I can do in that conversation when I'm talking to somebody who has different views, meaning that they're very pro-Palestinian, is try to highlight why people that don't agree with her, what their fears are and what the barriers are to the other side listening. That's in general, that's usually what I can do to help a conversation is let the other side know what the barriers are to the other side hearing them. That being said, she sent me this Facebook video to watch, which was about spirituality. And I haven't responded yet because it really takes a lot of time and effort to do a good job. And I just, I'm not ready to do that. I haven't slept, I'm tired, I have a headache. That being said, Hank, I feel like there is some crossroad there where spirituality and that belief system, that sort of crosses over where a lot of misinformation occurs and it divides people. And there's something that I feel can be untangled there. And at least for me and where I wanna start is where people want to consciously focus and become more aware of their own conscious evolution in small group communities where we are building relationships with each other, like in this group. There are, you know, I mean, it may be to some people, it may seem like a waste of time, but I know, even though I don't know any of you, well, I know some of you pretty well, but something happens. Something happens when you're meeting with people all the time. Yeah, I'm going to stop talking here, but um, that's the beginning point. That, that, that's, that's my check-in, my incomplete check-in. I've been kicking around what to what to check in with and lots of different things passed through my mind. And then I was listening to each of you in turn. And the thing I think I want to head toward is I wish I could see each of our reasoning trees or whatever you want to call it. I wish I could see inside each of our minds how we hold the things we hold because Doug, I know that you have one pressing, urgent 
uh, thing that needs to happen that you wish we were all working on. And yet I think sometimes, Stacy, when you report in on conversations you've had with people who are very different from you and hold different opinions, I think that that work is more useful than us logicking our way through or sciencing our way through a variety of things. <clears throat> and yet another part of me believes that we need to do all the work possible to make the arguments and data and evidence as evident as possible, kind of as Klaus was saying that, that he's feeling that the Neobooks process is helping him through um, so that we can compare notes and figure things out. But, but many of us are saying things because we hold beliefs that haven't made it into the conversation. And one of my wishes, desires, hopes is that by keeping the conversation quite loose and letting it go places, we will trip across some insights and some things that allow us to figure those things out. Because I don't think logic, certainly, I mean, there's a, there's a question, there's a thought in my brain that's like, what will cause people to change their minds about climate change? <clears throat> and it's been there for a long time now. And we've, in the meantime, last year was the hottest year ever with a lot of extreme climate events. There's plenty of uh, uh, research reports and other kinds of things saying this is like the house is on fire and it's about to float down over over a cliff like the old Gary Larson cartoon of the crisis clinic. Um, and still nobody's movable, partly because this is about politics and power, partly because it's about us versus them, partly because there's a whole lot of unexplored things that have little to do with reason, a lot to do with faith and tribe that we don't know how to get through. And I, uh, I watched the news also, and it depresses me also. And, um, what I keep coming back to is how do we let the air out of the tires of the Trump juggernaut? And I'm, I, Trump is living in bullet time right now. It seems like there's at least 91 bullets aimed at him and he is, he's going to try to dodge them all. And I don't think he can dodge them all. And I'm unclear which of the bullets is actually lethal to his ambitions to control the country or the world again, because some of these bullets... Uh, Hitler and uh, Lula both served time before becoming presidents of their respective countries. And uh, that didn't seem to slow them down. Uh, and they're very different people, Hitler and Lula. I'll say that for sure. Uh, Lula was in jail because his political enemies put him there. Um, and so I just would love, to, I, I'm, I keep trying to figure out now that we have strong AI, can we infer from somebody's speeches and writings what that tree looks like? Can we, how do we get some assistance? Because I'm weird. I'm several sigmas way down the trail of the, 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 the distribution because I externalize what I believe as much as I can every day into this brain thing, which is also a little bit too weird and arcane for everybody else. But I, that, I did a podcast some months ago with Tiago Forte, the build a second brain guy. And I, did, I hadn't read a lot of his stuff, but in the call I learned that his second brain is his private external notes. And he's got a pretty elaborate note-taking system. His third brain is whatever he publishes for the outside world. So most of the work he's doing in his system is just for him. And I think most of us, I wish most of us were working for us, not for me. Uh, not for ourselves, and that we would share and externalize as much of this as we can so that it's more visible. And as we approach each other in situations where we're concerned that our priorities are mixed up, that we're not doing the right thing, that we're not pulling together, whatever, we would at least have some tangible issues to talk about, including why we believe certain things so strongly. What is it that we're convinced of? that makes us think that this particular thing is the one thing we should focus on and how that works. I wanna somehow make that more palpable, more tangible, more useful. Uh, and then I think what Klaus was talking about a moment ago is that the exercise of doing that helps clarify your own thinking a bit. It's a, a moment I had many years ago when I was at New Science Associates, probably around 1990, I think, or 1989. I was writing a, 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 a report about a speech I'd been giving for a while. And it turned out that as I wrote the report, I realized that the graphic I was using, the illustrative graphic I was using in the speech had the axes backwards and wasn't really logical. And as, as I converted 
the stuff I've just been saying while waving my hands in front of like, you get it, there's an image. Like, like this is this makes sense. When I had to turn it into words, it had to get more precise. It had, the, the words actually had to like work. Um, if you pay that much attention to words. For a lot of people, words is just voids. You know, they're, they're going by. Um, and I will... I will stop now, but I'm I'm the reason that OGM exists in some sense is my quest to try to figure out how do we see and feel what each other thinks, including the feel part. I think the feel part is like insanely important. Um, when we talk to people who disagree with us a lot, they feel things as strongly as we do, and there's a reason for it, and there's a way through there. And if we can slow down enough. To get there, then maybe we can all cooperate on solving some of the world's problems because our 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 Mexican standoff right now means that we're not cooperating to solve anything, and that's going to kill us in the end. Just exactly the way Doug is predicting, if we don't solve the rest of these issues. So with that, I'm complete. Thank you, since, Jerry. Since you brought up words, I just want to interject one thing that's been on my mind because I tend to be very particular with the words that I use and I think it's so important. But I recently learned that in like languages like Korean, um, Chinese, I, I don't remember which language specifically it was, but that a word that is spelled exactly the same has like five different meanings just based on the tone. And I thought that was so important when especially when you're thinking about sound and frequencies and you get into the more like the quantum physics kind of stuff which you know if, if you're going to start thinking about how we manifest reality or, or if you're thinking about emotions or the messages that you give and receive from people and then you understand that just the tone of something changes the entire meaning. Seeing it in print, at, at least in English, the sound of the word is going to have, like I think about the word, like some people say you're trapped in the matrix. And I think of the difference between saying you're trapped in the matrix or you're trapped in a story. The word story has a totally different tone than the word matrix. So I'm just going to use that as the example and be quiet now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. I will point out that we're not quite in the conversational part of our check-in round yet. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. So, so um, I've been um more and more immersed in connecting with and reorienting my experience in the world through an energetic lens and um and giving far less weight and attention to the rational Um, and far more attention to uh, the sensing dimensions and grounding dimensions and um, motivation or fiery dimensions. And um, spiritual, not in a religious or woo-woo context, but spiritual in a um, space, opportunity, unbounded, um, opening to and connecting with. So um, sort of reverse engineering from words and reactions and behaviors to underlying experience. Um, you know, Doug, what, what came up for me in your share was not 
the the words, but the underlying emotional driver behind it. Uh, this is this you're wasting my time. And which is about your relationship to you and your time. And that moment and that share was honest. And I, I want to acknowledge and appreciate you for sharing it and voicing it. I I I get I get you. I hear that. <laughs> um and um So I, through my lens, so much of what I am seeing and the way I'm experiencing it in terms of the news and all of the, the stuff um, is different and, and becoming more and more different by the day um, because so much of it is constructed is synthetic and artificial. It's made by man. And so I'm finding um, the human preoccupation with the fact that we can think abstractly and create things and do all these things, um, that those are meaningful, substantial, and real. Um, relative to um, being. And so much of it is made by our own hand. So much of it is our own creation of our own mirages and our own illusions and attachments and beliefs and all of that. It's all rooted in stuff made by us for us that doesn't have any grounded connection to reality like really abstracted stuff is driving most of the adverse and negative consequences and um, as much and as fast and as instantaneously as we're capable of creating it all, we're also capable of changing our mind. And we're capable of letting things go and of dropping things. And so uh, for me, I'm like insanely optimistic in, in my belief and faith that at a certain point, the sensed felt awareness and connection to what's happening um, ceases to make sense. And, and I have the ability to go, uh, no, <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and, uh, and I have a belief that, you know, 8 billion people like, you know, there's a healthy enough percentage of others similarly situated that will get to that point at some point sooner or later. Now, we have demonstrated historically that, you know, um, we've slaughtered millions and had wars in order to get to that point, but we, we do get to that point one way or another. Um, so I'm really interested in things that can catalyze that awakening on an individual level. Um, and, and, and so the, the holiday time was very much about deepening my ruminations around that. Um, and, and last on a note, um, we, we've been a, a dog household since uh, 35 years, since my wife and I have been together. And uh, we rescued a cat two days ago. <laughs> it was 30 degrees out. And a neighbor knocked on the door and said, there's this cat and it's driving our, us crazy. And, you know, I'm going to call animal control, but I thought of you. And, what, and I've come to learn there is something called the cat network, which is a network of cats. And cats find their owners under these circumstances, apparently. So I'm now... Um, learning and feeling into the world of cats, which is really extraordinary. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'm complete.
will check in, speak into this, into the void or into the not void. Um, <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm struck by a lot of what I've been hearing and the kind of relationship between various things. Um, I had a great conversation with a, a friend um, last night over dinner about um, about you know circles of control and the notion of um, being able to let go of what you can't control um, but being active in what you can control and certainly um, climate is is there there are things within your control and things beyond your control um but the way that people on this planet relate to each other um and the um causes of disagreement and war and um, tribalism in its worst aspects um, are both within and without our control <laughs> and seem to me crucial to being able to do anything about climate and war and um, hunger and income inequality um and i don't know that <clears throat> i don't know that we're going to solve it in time to avert climate catastrophe um it it kind of seems to me You know, to to get all get on the same page to do something about this within the time we have seems, and and I'm an optimistic person seems a little bit like too high a bar um, for us to to clear. I hope I'm wrong, um, but. Uh, <laughs> sharing brains um and and the ai possibilities um inherent in let's see if i can put this coherently um you know gill mentioned that the idea of managing the public and, and private brain seemed like you know a heavy lift um, and, you know, Jerry was talking about uh, Tiago Forte and, um, and how little of what, how little of his brain was public. Um, and, you know, and then there's all the portion of our brain that is pubic. So referring to the chat. So, you know, that's a distraction or a joy and a joy. Sorry. Um, the idea that with the digital manifestations of what we are, what is in our brain, we might agree to share and trust um, with a commonsensical public and thereby, thereby magnify our ability to find consensus beyond tribe. Um, to me seems like the Hail Mary that could win this, this battle. And it involves technology, but it invo also involves trust and, and willingness um, to
to concede a little of the power that we hoard um, to the consensus of all of us. Um, so, you know, thinking about what's possible within my circle of control, sphere of control, um, I think about ways to um, enable that sharing of of knowledge and expertise and ways to um, model the kind of trust in others to concede that I don't know the answer and I want to empower someone who does. Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm dumping a lot of, of thoughts that are connected and not a conclusion and not a prescription, um, and wishing that we were all doing that and, uh, and having a benevolent, um, AI that could take those sentiments and let us, um, let us find our commonality um, because we're so good at finding reasons to define ourselves differently, whether it's religion or race or nationality um, or, you know, party, um, gender, you name it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's where my head is and I'll leave it there. So thanks. Well, for me, I must admit that in, in December, I was thinking 2024 was going to be our breakout year um, for all the movements that are happening around the world. And today has been a downer. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I think my guess is just about everybody here is an optimistic person. You probably wouldn't be if you weren't sitting here. Um, and yet all the optimism innate to us isn't coming out today. Um, it's, it's kind of in this space of um, what I perceive Of focusing on the problem, all the problems, and uh, think trying to think out solutions at scales beyond us. Somebody said we need to control. Can we control this or control that? None of us control anything. We try. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, maybe, maybe you control your brain, Jerry. Uh, maybe you control, maybe you control some things. Um, but your conscious self hardly controls anything. Um, and, and I think that if we keep trying to figure out how we're going to fix this by controlling it, that if we try to figure out how are we going to get logically above this or figure this out through logic or rational ways, it's not to say that we don't need those. But we don't need more information about the problem. And we don't need more solutions to the problems, in my opinion. We have them. We know what the solutions are. The The... I'm sorry, Mike, I don't know you very well, but um, 
name a problem that we don't have an idea about how to solve it. If we could only X, Y, Z, right? And and we'll get a chance to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, well, let's talk at length about this, but I, 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 I'm i a technologist. I, I look at a lot of sociology problems that are unsolved. Open conversation segment is near. Right. My my point is to do just that, to, to strike up a conversation that isn't about the negative that we've been talking about. But, um, but talking about the things that we can do as individuals that we can act on today and not waiting for another year and so that January of next year, we're not having this conversation again. Because I've been part of these communities for a long time. And every single January, it's the same conversation. And we're optimistic in December and we're down in January. And then we start the year thinking, well, nothing's really changed other than the number on the year. And here we are with the same problems and the same issues and the same nightmare uh, facing us. And I feel for Doug, because to be honest, I feel the exact same way Doug does. We're wasting fucking time. Um, and we're wasting it not because we're giving each other time to think and not because we're honoring each other's ability to speak and so forth. In my opinion, we're wasting it because we're talking rather than acting. And acting even in small ways, in my opinion, takes us beyond trying to think through problems, find the exact solution, come up with what we think is going to be the, the solution, whether it be in politics or economics or you name it. But how do we take action in small ways that diverts us from all that thinking about the problem and gets us active in ways that new ways of doing us better to steal from Doug turns into new ways of doing everything better um i i it just we got to stop we've got to stop thinking that we can think our way out of this and then we've got to stop thinking that we can talk our way out of it and we've got to stop thinking that we can figure out an answer better than the answers we already have until we get into action, at which point we will figure out better answers. I don't know if that kind of energy is welcome this morning, but it's certainly what I'm feeling. Thank you. So there was a there was a a really nice piece in um, in the Plex that just came out, and it was about conversation. I think I think um, Gil had originally published it. Um, so I've spent. The last seven years predating COVID, 35 to 40 hours a week in Zoom conversation spaces. The favorite being the one that was just conversation without any agenda whatsoever. And, and the basis for that was, and consistent with my mantra, which is how do, how, how do human beings do human beings better? Um, 
seemed like a good place to start was how do we talk to each other? Like start, you know, crawl before we walk, walk before we run. Like how do we actually communicate each other um, dif differently? Doug, I may, I may interrupt you for a second. I think you've already checked in, correct? Yes, I have. Uh, there are still two people who have not. Oh, and, I'm sorry. And I we're thought... not, and Klaus also, uh, we're not quite in conversation space, and I know we're going to run out of time shortly. My apologies for that, but to honor no, our, that's okay. Yes, I apologize. Our protocol. Thanks. Uh, so I think we have Stuart and Ken who have not uh, not talked yet, and Gil. I talked. <clears throat> oh, that's right, you did. Um, so if you can hold off, <laughs> uh, my mistake. So if you, if you can hold off for a sec. Um, let's see if, than my usual optimism, but I talked. <laughs> it's true. Let's see if Ken and Gil would like to go. And if not, we can go into conversation. Good day, everybody. And it's a good day. I'm above ground and I'm vertical and I'm with friends and I'm healthy. And despite all the problems in the world, I'm still standing. So that makes it a good day. And even on days when I'm not feeling well, it's a good day because I'm above ground and vertical most of the time. You know, I'm not a theist, but I've studied a lot of different religions. And I read this wonderful book years ago by Stephen Mitchell, who's a a Jewish guy who's a, a Zen student um, and a translator speaks several languages and he, he it's called the gospel according to Jesus. And he went back and looked at what did Jesus actually teach? He found out Jesus said two things more than anything else. And the first thing he said was fear not, do not be afraid. The second thing he said was love thy neighbor as thyself, which is an amazing systems thinking teaching. Because if you recognize that you and your neighbor are the same, then you treat each other very differently. And I've written about this in the Plex and elsewhere, but turn off the freaking media. It is designed to make you depressed and anxious and afraid. I can't control the world. I can't control, as Jose was saying, I can't control much. I can't influence more than I can control. And what I've come to recognize is that I, I find myself paying attention to the media and I get anxious and afraid. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, what are we going to do? And if I turn it off and start to focus on who do I know that's doing good work and where can I find news of people doing good work? And if I look through the lens of what's happening that I can amplify, that's working, that is, that is useful, there's tons and tons of stuff. So I try to focus on that as Jose was saying, what can we do that what's working, right? Like, um, and I'm really... I struggle with this because I do scan the headlines and I tend to focus more on the climate stories and, and human interest or health stories or science than I do politics. But it's really freaking depressing out there in terms of what's happening in politics. But this is a very old story. This stuff has been going on for hundreds or thousands of years. Why do we keep getting tracked in the same thing? Because people are afraid and they treat each other as if they're different. Oh, you know, you're not like me. You know, I'm better than you. And in my work with organizations, when I facilitate, you know, I try to make groups smarter together. And the number one killer of collective intelligence is arrogance. The number one support is humility. I don't know it all. You know, I take information in, I, I have incomplete information. I make predictions about the future. And that creates a mood for me of either hope and optimism or, or fear and, and anxiety and how that mood affects me is the way that I'm going to operate in the world. So I am refusing on a daily basis to operate out of fear and anxiety. doesn't mean I don't experience it. I, I experience it a lot. You know? um, but I won't, I won't make my decisions from that place. I, I will allow myself to let it fully enter me, move through it, come out the other side and say, what can we do? So I, I may have told this story before, but 30 some odd years ago, I was at a workshop with Joanna Macy. We did something called the Karen of Morning. So everybody went out in, into the, we were up in the northern woods of California. Everybody went out and spent an hour meditating on something in the world that's disappearing. And we all found a rock. We brought it back and, and we one at a time got up and placed the rock in the center of the circle and said, this is 
for the dolphins. This is for the seals. This is for the whales. This is for the giraffes or the elephants or whatever it is. And talked personally about what that meant to us. And we all went back to this big outer circle and said, join us this day. Now, the next circle in is the circle of reporting. Stand up, walk around, and call out whatever's on your mind. And people were saying, every 15 minutes, a man rapes a woman in America. And the response is, we hear you. Everybody says, we hear you. And people just let loose with all of their anxieties, all of their fears, all of the horrible things they were carrying around and declared them. And everybody said, we hear you. And the next circle in from that is the circle of emoting, which is, I am so freaked out. I don't know what to do. I'm this, all of your emotions. And the response again is, we hear you. And the next circle in closest to the stones is the circle of surrender. And people will just lay on the ground and scream or weep or, or wail and cry. And pretty soon everybody was in that circle and we were just, we were all reduced to a, a, a huge pile of sobs and tears. And, and then it subsided and it was really quiet and it was silent, a deep, deep silence. And somebody said something and somebody made a joke out of that. And the whole, everybody laughed. And there was this tremendous release. And Joanna said, this happens every single time I do the exercise. We go through this horrible, despairing, dark, dark place, and we become silent. And then the cosmic giggle bubbles up again. Somebody makes a wisecrack and everybody cracks up because that's the human spirit coming through on the other side of the despair. So whenever I find myself despairing, I try to let it enter me, emote it, get it out of me, move into the silence, and find something that I can laugh about, something that's going to be carrying me forward. Michael Mead says that we need more public grief rituals. When we start to grieve in public, it used to be in the old, old world, when someone died, you walked around with sackcloth and ashes and people knew you were mourning. No one knows people are mourning anymore, and everybody's mourning. So rather than try and fix stuff, Start to make your grief more public. Have public grief rituals, I think would be an amazing thing to heal what's going on. Because it's not going to be healed at the level of intellect. It's not going to heal the level of words. It's going to be healed at the level of silence in some way. Doug Carmichael, if you can hear me. Um, well, sometimes when we do the Quaker meeting here, and Jerry says, you know, the, the Quakers say, unless you can improve the silence, don't break it. And I sit there and go, I can't improve this silence. I find silence to be tremendous. I have sat 21-day meditation retreats, and believe me, there's a profound healing in silence. So I have no trouble with the fact that the world is burning and I'm sitting silently. My first, actually, that 21-day meditation retreat, Two 10 days plus a day in the middle. So I moved from the meditation hall to a different hall as they brought in the, new, the next 10 day group. And the third day after that, in the Dharma talk, the teacher very unskillfully said, Well, look at the look at the genocide happening in Rwanda. Now I had no idea what was going on. I'd been in silence for 14 days, totally away from the world. And all of a sudden I found out that people are hacking each other to death with machetes in Rwanda. And it hit me so hard. And I thought, what the hell am I doing? I'm sitting on a cushion while the world is falling apart. How am I possibly making a difference? And I went to that teacher and I spoke to her and, and she said, I'm so sorry. I, I really was unskillful to not recognize there were people here who didn't know about it. So she apologized and she said, but now that you're in it, this is dukkha. This is suffering. This is what it means to enter into suffering. And all you can do is sit with it. And recognize that it is part of your life. It is part of existence. And you can you can collapse. You can have it roll over you. You can have it crush you. Or you can create space for it and say, despite the suffering, there's still good things in the world. There's still people sitting in meditation with loving hearts and kindness. And that's what I choose to focus on. Yeah, I, I know what's going on. You know, very intimately. It tortures me but I don't surrender my agency to it. I don't surrender my ability to stand strong and say, even in the face of this, I won't be afraid. So I refuse to buy into the media narrative that Trump's going to win, that the world's going to curl up and blow away. It might, 
And if it does, that's that's suffering of humanity. You know, you take on a body, you're going to suffer. That's a direct quote from the Buddha. Take on a body, you're going to suffer. But there's a way out. And it starts with not being afraid. And it starts with recognizing that the cause of your suffering is attachment. And if you can learn to be non-attached, which is different than detached, which is taking yourself out of the picture completely and not caring, but to be non-attached is to be present and active and open-hearted. Then you can find your way through. It's hard. I'm lonely a lot of times. That's where I am. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. We're getting right near the end of our time. Um, Gil hasn't been visible, but I don't know if he's listening. I'd love to make room for him if he wants to go. If not, we can talk a little bit. And Ken, if you have a poem for us, that would be lovely. Gil's silence being a potential sign that he is not there. Let's go to Stuart Klaus and then a poem. You're muted, Stuart. Just a couple of thoughts. I, I appreciate um, Jose's um, <laughs> reflection that uh, every January this happens, <laughs> that we've all kind of been on holiday and disengaged from, you know, um, what we see and, and observe that's that's problematic. And, and you know, um, um, Bill, uh, the notion of of you know a medical professional um, <laughs> not understanding that there is depression and there's cause to be depression uh, in the universe that we're that we're that we're living in. Um, uh, Michael, I, I I thought for a moment or at least where my brain went when you were talking about ai as a solution my my brain went oh fuck another religion okay that ai is going to solve everything i mean that's where my that's where my brain went when i when i when i when i when i heard that um and just appreciation for all of the perspectives and wisdom and open sharing in terms of where people are even though it you know wasn't pleasant and it wasn't activist and ken thanks for your wisdom in um in uh in 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 in, in bringing us someplace else that's all you've lifted me out of my depression and given me a lot to to um to think about and cogitate and yeah okay um yeah i'll, I'll get back to tilting at windmills so thank you all, and and for all of the entries in the in the um, uh, in the chat. Yeah, I just wanted to um, take issue with the idea that we know solutions to problems. Um, I mean, as you know, I'm using theory. You the process structure of theory you for pretty much anything I do and the ref the um, reflective um, or uh, reflexive uh, response to identifying a problem is to think about a solution do you have a solution for it whereas theory you really asks you to go down a steep curve you know starting with the iceberg model uh, to really look behind it and just give you one quick example in the food uh, industry, you know, in the food system, um, you have all kinds of solutions to problems. No one thinks about the socioeconomic impacts of these solutions. You know, the fact that 44 million people live on food stamps. So how to change this? Uh, how do we do lab corn meats, for example, and, and revert into... Uh, techno solutions here without addressing the people that are being that are losing their jobs in the process that require no skills you know you now see the electrification uh, sector uh, or initiative and 
complete failure you know, to train people to work on electric engines instead of combustion engines, what, what are gas station owners supposed to do? So that I can give you a thousand examples of where we have solutions without really having thought through what that actually means. Uh, and so the this is why I'm I'm, I'm just so uh, I was so impressed. I've been doing you know, uh, mega level projects uh, all my life, and and uh, uh, I, I I I see Theory U as a project management guide you know, system uh, that really that really uh, uh, guides you through process steps to where you reach a state of uh, alignment um, that then allows you to really see what where solutions can lead you to and, and start prototyping. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, we're near the end of our time, but uh, Michael and Jose, if you want to Go relatively briefly. Yeah, I just wanted to to quickly uh, distance myself from um, from Mark Andreessen's techno optimism in terms of what I was saying about AI. AI just that it's you know it's a longer conversation, but the idea of flipping the AI model to you know the the use of personally controlled AI agents as opposed to the whole centralized model that's running roughshod is is what I was talking about you know that something much more consensual just that and and, and real briefly uh, Klaus uh, and and I think Mike as well um when I say we know, I, I don't mean to say that we know how to implement those solutions in a way that will actually work. But our problem isn't that we don't have the technology or the the ideas or the inventions or the, the necessary tools to fix the problems we have. What we don't have is a way of doing it. And we're waiting for that way of doing it to come from the place that it has come traditionally, the top. And it's not going to come from the top. So that's my point. It isn't that, yes, we have all the answers in the perfect way of how it's going to happen. Um, but we don't need new, you know, we're not waiting for the, the, the miracle to be the solution. Pretty much everything we've got, if we implement correctly, we could solve our problems. And Jose, I think you've you've opened a lovely topic for a future call because right? um, it's a it's a long conversation. It's interesting. It's nuanced, uh, and, and it starts with oh that a recent guy in his techno optimism manifesto can't stand it, and all this other kind of stuff. But I, I think uh, Mike, I think maybe we could think of how to organize a a slightly more structured call around that. I want to remind everybody that next Thursday, we're going to talk about democracy and or governance, little G governance. What are some functional models? What might the next, What? how How do we either fix or replace democracy? What should it be? Um, and feel free to invite other people who are experts in this into the call and all that. Thanks, Dagby. Uh, and Gil, you've got uh, a moment and then we'll go to Ken for our closing poem. Yeah, I just wanted to echo um, what Jose said. Uh, we have the know-how, we have the technology, we have the money. Um, uh, Mark Jacobson's uh, analysis is that um, transitioning you know, like 95% of the world's countries to 100% uh, renewable wind, wave, and solar could be done for about $65 trillion, which is about the money that McKinsey says needs to be invested in maintaining fossils over the same period of time. So the question is not the technology or the money, it's the will. You know, do we want to do it? And that begs question, uh, Ken's familiar question of who's we, buddy? Who and that maybe takes us into a conversation about democracy. Thank you, Gil. How long since your cataract surgery finished? About an hour. Wow, thank you for joining us.
So that's why I look bug eyed. But uh, I, I was able to listen to about the last 20 minutes. Uh, Ken, you've got the con. Let's go back to Mary Oliver again. <clears throat> the kookaburras. In every heart, there is a coward and a procrastinator. In every heart, there's a god of flowers just waiting to come out of its cloud and lift its wings. The kookaburras, kingfishers, pressed against the edge of their cage. They ask me to open the door. Years later, I wake in the night. Remember how I said to them, no, and walked away. They had the brown eyes of soft-hearted dogs. They didn't want to do anything extraordinary, only to fly home to their river. By now, I suppose the great darkness has covered them. As for myself, I am not yet a god of even the palest flowers. Nothing else has changed either. Someone tosses their white bones on the dung heap. The sun shines on the latch of their cage. I lie in the dark, my heart pounding. Again? Please. In every heart, there is a coward and a procrastinator. In every heart, there is a god of flowers just waiting to come out of its cloud and lift its wings. The kookaburras, kingfishers, pressed against the edge of their cage. They asked me to open the door. Years later, I awake in the night and remember how I said to them, no, and walked away. They had the brown eyes of soft-hearted dogs. They didn't want to do anything so extraordinary, only to fly home to their river. By now, I suppose the great darkness has covered them. As for myself, I am not yet a god of even the palest flowers. Nothing else has changed either. Someone tosses their white bones to the dung heap. The sun shines on the latch of their cage. I lie in the dark, my heart pounding. That poem is a heavy lift if you pay too much attention to it. Thank you. Uh, there, I just I subscribe to the poet poem of the day, and this morning's poem, uh, where, let me put it in the chat, uh, was about a woman helping her father through hospice care, and it reminded me mightily of my own mom's hospice experience two years ago. So it's a, a quite sadder note, but it really beautifully captures the experience. Uh, I thank you all uh, for your patience and your presence and uh, your contributions and your co-thinking. I wish I could see it all. I want like a big x-ray machine. Maybe Zoom could add that as a feature, do you think? Um, anyway, uh, go ahead. AI, AI, Jerry. AI, AI, that's our answer. That's our Maybe. solution. <laughs> Maybe we need a Y-ray machine rather than an X-ray machine. Oh, <laughs> nice. And and better than AI would be telepathic uh, webs. Thank you, Gil. I'll bring an envelope next time. I pretend to be Karnak. <laughs> <laughs> Study Huna, Thanks. get on the coconut and wireless. The Jerry, it's all about the hat. It's all about the hat. <laughs> Excellent. Love that. Thanks, all. Happy New Year. Happy we'll New turn Year. off the radio and the and the newspaper and the news. Just yeah, exactly. Everybody. Listen to your friends. Bye.